<laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Sadly, that's the last over. <laughs> we'll appear in the talk, but at least I will get reimbursed now. So, um, <laughs> so what I want to talk about are modular sensor categories. And uh, really what I'm going to do is apply some newer ideas in topological field theory to say something about um, them purely algebraically. And hopefully I'll have time at the end to uh, link that up with something a little close to formal field theory, but three-dimensional topological field theory. But maybe I should set a little bit of context before I start. So let me remind you of where these came from. So, I suppose they were first identified by Moore and Cyberg in the context of rational uh, conformal field theories. And the important point is these are chiral field theories. So the one Anthony was talking about this morning, the, the fermion, uh, he was talking about a non chiral version. Or, no, is it chiral version? No. Okay, he was talking about the chiral So there's a chiral version. And um, a good example of these are what are called the West Sumino Witten models, holomorphic West Sumino Witten models. And they have the property that they're not quite ordinary uh, field theories, in the sense that if we take, say, a closed surface, and if I call chi conformally the uh, field theory, then in an ordinary quantum field theory, we would expect this to be a number, it would be the partition function. But instead, this lives in a vector space. So this is an element of some vector space. Maybe I'll call that F. And that, in the literature, is called the space of conformal blocks. And Moore and Seinberg studied these conformal blocks and how they change when you do various sewing operations on surfaces. And that's where the structure modular tensor category emerged. And then a little bit later, Witten uh, realized that in fact these vector spaces, first of all, they only depend really on the underlying topological surface, at least once you frame the surface. And, um, and not only that, but they're actually vector spaces which are part of the three-dimensional theory. So this is part of the three-dimensional topological. Whereas this chi is a two-dimensional conformal theory, field theory. So in some sense, this two-dimensional theory takes values in this three-dimensional theory. And the modular tensor category even appears here in this three-dimensional theory, not having to do with three manifolds, not having to do with two manifolds, but actually something attached to the circle in that theory. So, um, so in that sense, it's uh, in the math literature that was Reshatikin and Taraya who made the invariance you get of three manifolds in the corresponding, and the, also the not invariance that Wong uh, discovered, all fit into that package. And they, just, they construct these invariants starting from the modular tensor category. So those are some places where um, those things appear. They also nowadays are 
topological form of computing. Anyhow, um, so let me start uh, at the beginning. So let's recall the Norman Royal candidate. Right? Say A, it has a unit and it has a tensor product. And a graded category has, in addition, a braiding, which for any two objects gives an isomorphism from x tensor y to y tensor x, where x and y are objects in A. So it's a kind of commutativity. And of course, it has to be natural with respect to x and y. So another way to say this is that beta itself takes the tensor product operation, which takes two inputs and gives you its output. And here we take transposition. We take our two inputs and first transpose them, and then <coughs> we do the tensor product. And what the braiding gives is an isomorphism between this operation of tensor product and the operation of tensor product. So we can sort of give a kind of graphical representation of these things. Namely, the tensor, the monoidal category is in a sense one dimensional. So what we can do is think of copies of our monoidal category as living on the line. And every time two of these come together, then uh, we do the multiplication of so you can think of them as, as like that, and it's naturally associative. If the line codes that associativity, it's meant not to matter whether we collide the first two first and then the third, or the second two first with that. So it builds in a kind of associativity. So that's the monoidal category. And a braided monoidal category is really two-dimensional. So this is the half line line set of the plane. And here we would have copies of A's. And again, they come together and uh, multiply. But now, when we multiply, we could bring them together like this, or we could loop one around the other and then bring them together. And that's meant to be the idea that, uh, that the multiplication has this kind of commutativity. So if you want, we could make a picture that. So if we make a time a movie with time say going down, and we follow these points, then we can have them move one around the other, and then have the idea that these multiplications are the same. So there's a one-dimensional version, a two-dimensional version, and obviously higher dimensional versions. And this is the kind of graphical calculus that one usually makes for these graded tensor categories. So let me just give some examples. Everybody knows these examples, but um, just something to keep in mind. So if G is a finite group, it's very easy examples. Then an example of a the monoidal category is, let's say, vect g. This is the category of, of complex, say, vector bundles over g. So g is a finite set, so it's just a collection of vector spaces. And uh, the tensor product is pushed forward. under the multiplication of the group. So that's in other words convolution. So that says that if I have two vector bundles over G, these are finite sets. So if I want to know the answer in a group element on X, then if I have a vector bundle say W1, and I want to tensor it with W2, 
evaluate the answer at x. This is the sum over x1, x2 equals x, w1 and x, and so w2, x1, x2. So that's just the convolution. So you can think of it as a version of group algebra, except instead of using coefficients, which are complex numbers, we're using coefficients, which are complex vector spaces. So that's definitely not greater unless g is commutative. But there is one that's graded, which is to take um, the category of G equivariant. So here, G is meant to act on itself by, um, by conjugation. And we not only have for each group element, so here's the group, say X. So for each group element, I have a vector space, I'll give it X. But every time I have a uh, group element acting by conjugation, let's say G, and it maps us to um, GX, G inverse, one side or the other, and here we have we have to have a linear map that lifts this group element G. So if we have that data, then this ends up being braided. And the reason it ends up being braided, well, one picture is you can identify, how can we think of this copy of the group with G acting by conjugation? Well, if we take the circle, the geometric circle, and I think about principal G bundles, which is to say Galois covers of the circle, they're not necessarily connected, and the Galois group is G, acting as energy transitive with the fibers. Then how do we classify those? Well, if we give a base point on the circle, then uh, upstairs we can measure homotopy by picking not only a base point on the circle, but in the fiber upstairs, we have a finite cover. I take a base point there, and then I just lift it. It's a covering space. I go around, and I come back. There's some group element G that measures uh, where I've traveled. So if I put in the base point, then the set of this, the collection of these categories of bundles is just a copy of G. And there are no automorphisms that fix the base point. But then I have a copy of the group G acting, which moves the base point to get rid of that choice, and that conjugates this lower one. So if you think of that picture, then, um, then what's the tensor product? Well, take two of these circles and I take one inner circle around it. And so this is the eggs. I'm thinking of that annulus. And we have, let's put base points here, here, and here. And then if we have a bundle over here with, uh, let's say, with x1 as its polynomial, let's say x2, its polynomial, then, um, well, we can ask, can we extend it to a bundle over this two-dimensional surface? So again, these are just finite Galois covers. And the answer is, yes, you can. You can even get, you have these base points line up. In other words, just make that the identity of that base point anyway. And then the homonomy on the outside will be x1 times x2. And um, so if we, if we now look at vector bundles over the space of those principal bundles, then there's a gradient, which is in this picture, where I look at just a dimorphism that just braids those two circles. So it takes these kinds of guidelines. So I just literally move one circle around the other. That's a dimorphism. If you follow that through and write down the formulas of what that does to these vector bundles, then you'll see a gradient. First example of the modular tensor category. Okay, so um, so those are the objects I want to consider. Of course, there are much more intricate ones that come from uh, groups, group groups, polynomial uh, algebras, and so on. So among braided. So the ones I'll look at are also linear categories. 
vectors, just as these are. In other words, the home spaces are vector spaces. And um, so among these, write in tensor categories, modular tensor categories. Have certain finiteness. Well, it's both data and properties. Plus finiteness plus uh, non degeneracy. So the finiteness kinds of things. Well, one is that uh, objects have tools. So in this case, for example, when we have a vector bundle over the group, we also have a tool. So that's a kind of finiteness. These, th these are semi-simple with a uh, finitely <coughs> many symbols. That's an isomorphism. So every object can be written as a sum of these finite number of symbols. And uh, but then the right ones that you're really thinking of a beginning group in this one, right? Because no. you're covering these no. Well, the cover is not connected. No, it's a principal bundle, but the, the total space is not necessarily connected. So it's not like covered space. It's just a principal G bundle. So for any G, I have to trigger the bundle. We also have what's called a rhythm structure. So those are all to do with finite things. And then there's a non-degeneracy, which is usually expressed by saying a certain matrix called S that one gets from this kind of data is uh, convertible. But that's equivalent. And, well, I know it from a paper from Buechner, but I'm sure there are other, other sources. That's equivalent to saying the following. That if we look inside, um, so if this category is called A, A for algebra, if we look at the set of objects X such that, um, such that uh, for all Y in A, um, if I take the braiding from X, between x and y, and I compose with the braiding from y to x. So remember the braiding maps x tensor y to y tensor x. So that's the braiding between x and y. On the other hand, I can go back by the braiding from y to x, x tensor y. And I can ask that that be the identity map. So I can ask, for which objects is that true? That with any other object, y, it braids in this way so that the square is the identity. That's a kind of center, central condition, the higher center of this braided category. And if this is equal to just really multiples of one, so remember there's a special object, one. On the other hand, I can take one plus one, one plus one, etc. In other words, I can multiply one by any vector space. Those are all objects in my category. So a non-degeneracy condition, it's, it's a property of the braided tensor category that one always satisfies this when I take x equals one. And if that's the only thing that does it, then this is a kind of non-degeneracy condition. The opposite extreme is to say that every element x and y satisfy this, and that's what's called a symmetric normal category. So this is the opposite extreme. By the way, in terms of those pictures, the symmetric monoidal category would come if instead of one dimension where I have no commutativity, or two dimension where I have braiding, we go to three dimensions. Then you see the points can go around each other a little bit more in three dimensions, and that's enough to get that condition. So part of this talk is to say that these pictures really aren't um, powerful enough. There are more powerful things 
one can do here. And I should say right away that in this case, when you have a um, tensor category, then, um, then uh, Douglas, uh, Noah Smeiner, and Schomer Priest are studying using three dimensional, three dimensional manifolds to study those. And what I'm going to talk about is using four dimensional manifolds to study the Brady case. So, so let me explain how we get four manifolds. So everybody, I think, is happy with the idea of a category. And um, so I want to say the following term to Marina. So the Marina idea is one that very familiar in the von Neumann book already heard about it this morning, that if we have, let's say, A1 and A2 are algebras, then if we have an A1, A2, R1, is a map of A1, A2. So again, in terms of the one-dimensional picture, we have A1 here, and A2 here, we can have M sitting between them, different objects, and we can hit, hit it with A1 from the left and A2 from the right. That's a, that's a, that's a bi -mod. So we can think of that as a map from A1 to A2. And indeed, we can make um, we can make these into maps and then talk about maps of these maps, namely bi module maps that can use with the A1 and A2 action. So by having bimodules, you see, I haven't changed the underlying objects. They're still going to be, um, if, if these are algebras that are ordinary vector spaces, the M is also going to be a vector space. But without talking about linear maps of vector spaces, we have one extra layer of what a map is, namely we have a bimodule. Then we can use the linear maps to talk about a map between bimodules. If I have an M and an S prime, we can talk about a linear map. So that way we get an extra level of category. And we can do the same if we have this braided case. So in the braided case, we now have two extra steps. So two extra steps in the braided case. So in the braided case, we want to think of A1 and A2. Now we can have a line that divides them, and then we can have our module M sitting on that line. So again, we can have it's a left A1 module and a right A2 module. We just can come in and have a multiplication. But now M itself has a multiplication because I can have these points on the line moving and having a multiplication. So a map is a bimodule between A1 and A2, but the bimodule itself has a multiplication. It's compatible with the A1 and the A2. And now if I have two of these, two of these modules, say M and M prime, then uh, we can have another module, N, in there. And that N then could be acted on by one side from M and another side by M and prime. And on the other hand, the A's are still going to act. So in this way, we get two extra levels. One is the M mapping between A1 and A2. And then we can have the M mapping between M and M prime. This is all from the algebra structure without using whatever kinds of objects these are. So let's let. Have to do with braiding. Yeah, it has to do with braiding because I'm in the, well, in the pictures, I'm in the plane here. What's that? I mean, the braiding was just. 
filtration. That's right. So the braiding lets these two go around each other. When I have the module, I can only kind of cap, cap, well, I can still braid. I mean, I, well, if I have an A1 and A2 or a different, <coughs> then I can't, can't braid. But if these were the same, then I bring one around the other side. saying the math count, math A1, A2, is um, A2, A1, my modules. That's that. Good with that. Um, which is itself a tensor category compatibly with the M1, M2, and I multiply them by saying A1 on the left. Oh, so that's even confusing. So M and M prime are in my by one to M, and A1 is in my left algebra. Then, uh, then I have to be able to relate that. Similarly with an A2. So there's, there's a compatibility between that A1 action and this, um, this multiplication on M. So now we have an extra layer where if I have the M, now I can have M to be a map from M to M prime, where these are both A1, A2, A1, A2. And this will now be. itself have this, um, have this algebra structure, and then the, the A has to be So let's let this be the collection of linear C linear categories. And that itself is a two category. Dan, do you have uh, any suggestions of uh, examples for us to keep in mind of, of these two levels of bimodules? Yeah. Right. Um, let's see, if I go to the finite groups, I'll just try to um, You have 
C is a map from the center of C to vector spaces. So yeah. if I have if I have a tensor category C, C, it has its center Z of C acting on one side, and vector spaces is another graded category that acts on the other side. Is that an example of this? So that's so if you know what the, it's an the example center of a tensor category is, then another way to say this is that. See, this A1 is a braided is a braided tensor category. Yep. M is just a tensor category. So it has a center, which sure. is a braided tensor category. And I need a map from A1 to the center. Okay. And then a map from A2 to the center. Okay. Let's but do an example of the first layer. Uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to see examples of the second layer that aren't that aren't that aren't just functors. Yeah. So an example of the first layer, I think, is um, probably I gave you G equivariant vector bundles over. And I think those vector bundles over G is a one sided multiplication. Where the multiplication is again convolution. That would be an example. So if I take exactly that. So take A to be exactly variant vector. The trivial example is to take any graded tensor category and regard it as a left modulator of itself. Sure. Or a point modulator of itself. That's of course an example. Where in the module, as a module, I'm forgetting the braid, I'm just remembering the tensor structure. That would be an example. Okay. But, but, but here's an example where the module is actually the This still doesn't give us an example of an end to think of. The, of an end to think of. Yeah. Ah, the next layer. Um, well, uh, well, sorry. So, um, probably if I take a subgroup, if I take vector bundles on some quotient. Just mean vectors, vector bundles supported at one. But then how do I act? Well, then no, that, that's I a. Because uh, it's not a precursor. That's that G mod G. G mod G. Yeah, it's just vector space. No. So, sorry, so there you're thinking of a, of a, of a subcategory inside M and N as being <coughs> the inclusion of the subcategory into the big one? Well, it has to be a module. Well, I was imagining just giving a map of categories and any, any functor <coughs> automatically would be a bi-module just in the yeah. bicycle. Well, that's certainly true. Huh. That's certainly true. So, for example, we could do this as a um, left module for this guy. Yeah. We could have a similar thing for G prime and M prime. And then if we had a homomorphism from G to G prime. Sure. So the underlying object here, before I have the multiplications, the tensor product and the braided tensor product is just a category. And these already have two layers of maps because we have um, functors between them. But functors themselves are like sets, so they have all morphisms called natural transformations. Now, if we look at um, these tensor categories, and because of the Morita idea, these are a uh, free category, because we have the bimodules, and then we have functors between the bimodules and natural transformations. And if we look at braided tensor categories, then that's actually a four category. Because the 
Rita gives us two layers, and then what we had already gives us two more layers. So we get up to four categories without ever leaving objects, which themselves are categories. So now I can state the result that I didn't say at the beginning. I'm sorry, this is dry work. And we haven't quite finished proving it, so say for the same conjecture, and we'll almost prove it. And um, so I'll, I'll show you a theorem in a minute, which is proof, which is main step. But uh, right, so the conjecture is that if the modular tensor category is an invertible. I told you before that a, braided te a modular tensor category satisfies certain non-degeneracy conditions. And those non-degeneracy conditions here uh, reflect themselves in this invertibility. And the second statement is that um, as a one-sided A module, so in other words, that's using A as a map from a unit nothing acting on one side, and then on the left having A acting. Um, it is well, what might be called fully, it satisfies, as you said, loosely, a maximal finite distribution. So I said that the modular tensor category satisfies certain finiteness conditions. I didn't explain what they are. I'll explain a little bit. Invertibility is a very strong form of that. This, as a one-sided module, is not invertible, but it's as finite as it could be. And the interpretation of that, going back to the field theories, I'll explain at the end. Can you tell us what the inverse is? So the technique used to prove that is to use manifolds. And so I want to talk a little bit about manifolds, and in particular, words. Unless there are other questions before I <coughs> switch gears. Okay. So I mean, I could ask a mini question. What is this for? Yeah, well. Um, let me give an indication of how one proves it, and then I'll give you a question. That's part of, part of the story. So, um, Mordism dates back to the 50s, the thesis of René Tom, and uh, the idea is that if you have a manifold, and today I'm going to use just oriented manifolds of some dimension n that's compact, in this case oriented, then we put an equivalence relation on such manifolds by saying if there's a compact n plus one manifold whose boundary on one side is one of them, whose boundary on the other side is the other, then we say these manifolds are <coughs> equivalent, or important manifolds. And then again, manifolds have an immediate kind of group operation, which is taking disjoint union. And this equivalence relation reflects disjoint union, that's a symmetric Abelian operation, and so you get abelian groups in each dimension out of manifolds called Mordism groups. And that's what René Thom defined. I'll show you a little bit how to relate to homotopy theory, and there was a lot of work about Mordisms. After one generation, everything has to get categorified. So we don't remember, any, so we don't just forget the information in the equivalence relation, but we remember the equivalence. So in other words, we remember the manifold that tells us that. And so we think if we have a manifold here, say x, this is y0, and this end is y1, we want to think of that as a map from y0 to y1. And of course, we want to build then a category out of 
this, which means that if we have another app, now starting with what I want, I'm going to sum. So we have another prime mapping y1 to y2, and we can compose <coughs> these maps, and we compose by moving. So now we have two operations. One is this composition, and the other one is this Again, that's compatible. So this moving makes wordism now into a category. We get a category whose objects are closed manifolds and morphisms are these wordisms. And it's a monoidal category because we have disjoint union, taking disjoint union of the manifolds, the objects, and also the wordisms. <laughs> and this, this is, is uh, symmetric as we like. It's you like, so this is actually a symmetric model cap. Or very, it's just purely, purely even. So that's the idea. So let's start by thinking about what I'll call board one, where I'm going to label the dimension in a moment. We're going to start with points. The points are going to be the y's, and one manifolds are going to be the x's. So So notice that now in this boardism, there's a definite direction of time, which is telling me what is the input, what's the output. A map has an input, a domain, and a code. So I'll think of that as a time. And um, so here we want this to be, this is of course the identity map, say from the plus point to the plus point. So these are oriented manifolds, so there are two points. There's a plus point, and there's also Minus point. So that's going to be the identity because when I glue it onto anything, you see, we're only considering these, say, up to diffeomorphism, and gluing it to something like that doesn't change the diffeomorphism type. So that has to be the identity. So notice right away that the orientation conventions for manifold and boundary are a little bit uh, changed because if you have one, uh, any manifold with boundary induces an orientation on the boundary, but here we're taking this orientation to be plus, normally that would be called minus. So in making the orientations, we're taking into account the, whether it's in the domain or code of incoming or outgoing. So for example, the orientation has to be that over there. And notice, by the way, that this picture is obtained by reversing the time on that picture. Exactly. And we get from one picture to the other. And well, we could have pictures like this. Plus, plus, minus. Okay. And again, time is going from left to right. So we can have all sorts of pictures. Okay. And we can, of course, glue. The identity map knows the orientation. Now there's just the very simplest maneuver that happens right at the beginning. Which is the following. So this is a picture where time is going like this, and I have three distinguished times. Starting, middle, and and the middle is where I've done some gluing. And let's say that the arrows go like this. So when I glue, I get an oriented manifold. And so this is plus and plus by our dimensions. That's plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. And there's another such picture that looks exactly the same. <coughs> but with all the arrows. Bottom one is just the time reversal of the top one. And, um, well, on the other hand, this is the same picture, but if you want this invariance, it's just plus, plus. And this is the same picture, it's just minus. So this is the 
this is some kind of relation of one of the various pictures. Now, what does that relation mean? Well, let's have that dimension. So a one-dimensional topological quantum field theory is a homomorphism on the board one to, let's say, vector spaces over the complex numbers. So this is oriented borderism. So we should put something to indicate it's oriented. So what do I mean by a homomorphism? Well, I just mean that I replace every um, object gets mapped into a vector space, and every mordism gets mapped to a, a linear map of vector spaces. The compositions go to compositions, and we have the structure of a symmetric monoidal category. So the tensor product, the disjoint union, goes over into the monoidal structure here, which is tensor product, and the symmetry, which tells us this is symmetric, has to match the symmetry that's what I mean by homomorphism. When you draw these pictures, it looks like your Buddhism is actually embedded in a two dimensional thing. That doesn't matter because you're drawing pictures. Yes. So we should think of this as a representation. This is some sort of algebraic structure that we're representing a linear. So here's a nonlinear kind of symmetric monoidal category we're representing a linear. So the concept is just a representation. Okay, and what does this say? Well, it says we have now two basic vector spaces, V plus and V minus. Those are the images of the plus point and minus point. And this top picture then says we have a map from V plus to well, V plus tensor V minus tensor V plus. Because remember the disjoint union of these three points goes over to the tensor product. And then we have a map back which is um, going to be plus. And what are the maps? Well, we should break it up. We have, of course, identity maps, that's nothing. But we have these two kinds of maps. So we have this basic this map from <coughs> plus minus. That's a map from V plus tensor V minus to what? To the empty set. The empty set is the unit for the disjoint union. Empty set, disjoint union manifold is the manifold. So that has to go over into a vector space, which is the identity for tensor product. So that's just C. C tensor any vector space is that vector space. Do we need to make two respect the There's no homomorphism means under the, the tensor product on the domain on manifolds and a disjoint union on manifolds and tensor product on vector spaces. Disjoint unions go to tensor product. Addition and product. What addition? There's no addition. Uh, in disjoint union terms. Disjoint union goes over. That's that's addition. Right? Uh, no, no, well, okay. there's one there's one composition law in manifolds, which is disjoint union. So in the monoidal category, I'm thinking of that as a kind of tensor product. Call it what you want. But that but on vector spaces, I want honestly the tensor product. If we were doing by contrast, say homology. We wouldn't have mordisms, we would have topological spaces, and we could still think of disjoint unions. Disjoint unions would go over into the rec sums. Like the homology of the disjoint union is the rec sum of the homology. But a quantum field theory is some kind of exponentiated version of the, of the Hilbert space and the Fox space this morning. And um, so instead of direct sums, we have this products, exponentials convert sums to products. So it's very important in this quantum business that we have tensor products and not direct sums. So we have these two basic pictures, and this one gives us a map from C to B minus tensor plus. So those are called evaluations and co-evaluations, just to give them names. And so this map is, you see, it's the identity on B plus tensor this co-evaluation. This one, that's this one here. And then when we get over here, it's this evaluation tensor the identity of B plus. And what this says is that this composition has to be equal to the identity. And you get a similar statement for B minus in this diagram. So what that implies is that B plus is an exercise on the 
here. These are finite dimensional. And the evaluation is a non-degenerate duality. by finiteness, just having these manifolds and these simple pictures forces something on us in the representation. It forces that even though we might have thought we could assign arbitrary vector spaces, they in fact end up being finite dimensional. So here's another exercise for you, which is taking the codomain of a field theory to be complex vector spaces is very much what physicists do with quantum mechanics or the complex numbers for but in mathematics, of course, we can take the codomain to be lots of things. So we could, for example, take it to be abelian groups. Why not? Then b plus and b minus are abelian groups. And if you do the same exercise, then you'll find that they're finitely generated and actually also free of their intuition. On the other hand, if you want to see something more interesting, then instead of just abelian groups, you could take chain complexes of abelian groups. And then you could get yourself simple examples which just in this one-dimensional case play around, you learn a lot about what this definition is. But I just want to emphasize this point about this finiteness. So the finiteness is not only the finite dimensional, but we have a dual. And what these pictures say abstractly is that the plus point or the minus point are dual inside the category of manifolds. So let me give So this picture shows you that the plus point and the minus point are dual objects inside um, or one, inside oriented vorbism. And since the topological field theory is a homomorphism, it has to preserve all of these kinds of intrinsic categorical concepts because it's preserving all the structure of the category. So it has to map dual objects to dual objects. And that's what this argument says. Dual objects inside vector spaces are exactly finite dimensional vector spaces. The second definition is that x is invertible if there exists an x prime in C and uh, an isomorphism x times x prime. The order doesn't matter. So for example, inside vector spaces, what are the invertibles? Well, I need a vector space such that there's another one whose tensor product is a complex line. Well, the only way that can happen is if the vector space is one-dimensional. So one-dimensional vector spaces are exactly the invertibles. By the way, we could consider another category. Supposing I have a space x, manifold if you like. We could think of the category of vector bundles over x, again under tensor product. That's a symmetric. Category. 
And now an invertible object in this category is a line bundle. And notice that a line bundle is not necessarily isomorphic to the trivial bundle. So we can't have invertible objects which are not isomorphic. So from the humble beginnings of board one, what's the next step? The next step is <laughs> So what we're going to do, remember that we have a time for this. Sure. Now we're going to introduce a second. So we're going to, see in the first picture I just allow points to evolve. So for example here, I start with two points and then I collide them and then let them disappear. That's the movie. And now I'm going to start with a movie of points and make another movie. So I'm being filmed in a one dimensional movie and now you have to switch and film me. <laughs> My movie squared. So, um, so in other words, in this time, we're going to take these two elbows, and um, we're going to bring them together, and then do a simple surgery where I replace, I attach a one handle, where I replace these, and attach something across, so I'll end up with this. So that goes from the first doing the evaluation, followed by co-evaluation, and here I have the identity. These are maps from two points, the two points, plus point, and minus point. And so the picture I get here is, of course, a saddle. You mean abstract? This one and this one, are they different? They're the same evaluation, right? But I have to compose, so I have to line up the co-domain here with plus minus or the co-domain here plus minus. You mean, I, I could certainly make other compositions. That's what you mean. I could make a composition like this. I mean, that's a valid composition. It's just a different diagram. Well, these pictures aren't embedded in the plane. These are, these are just abstract oh, that's, that's okay. So I can accept that, but then this one seems to be different. What is the picture that shows that you need? This is straining my ability. It's just one of the values. Abstractly, it's, it's just that I have two maps. I have maps to time, so I can keep track of these. But other than that, it's just a manifold of corners. So in particular, there are things you might want to draw that if you tried to imagine them in three space would look like immersions. Like 
you actually try to do some braiding on a pair of pants. Like well, anyway, I want to consider format rules, which I definitely can't draw. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know we can embed manifolds in space, but that's not part of the structure. It's definitely not part of the structure. So I should say that, um, that Scott and Kevin Walker have a different approach to this where they don't have the times. But then they build in the kind of duality that's, that's here, and the higher versions are built in from the beginning. And that's, that's really more convenient. And what this finiteness condition study is basically that we can get rid of the times, because the duality is just sort of reversing the times. It's reversing the times. Okay. So, um, so now you see what a some bordism, then it's a map. And say that here it means the image of the vertical map. So everything maps to the vertical structure. But you have, I mean, the one, you know, like this is kind of like the part of the culture in the image of the communicator. Right. As you could say, we could leave some things on the point. Okay. <laughs> For today. Yeah. We could leave them out. <laughs> What's that? Oh. <laughs> well, so. under that. People built foundations under n categories for a while. In fact, you can do this definition, add some topology, and do it in families. This is that's how you interpret things in each n category. But um, so there's a lot of things one could say and a lot of superficial homotopy theory methods to make precise what those statements are. But for today, I want to work at this level. So the main theorem here is called the cohortism. And uh, well, it's due to Hopkins and Lurie in the case of two dimensions, and then Lurie in higher dimensions. Although again, the proof is although long, it's a long sketch. It doesn't have all those details quite yet. But in any case, what it says is that um, the topological field theory F is determined by its value on a point. And um, any uh, some x and c and any fully realizable x is at this point for some f. So if 
fully dualizable means it satisfies the maximal set of finite just conditions that one can expect from this idea of reversing the time error to dualities that I indicated before. So it's, of course, a more precise statement than that, but it says a particular thing. So the idea is it's really a theorem in Morse theory, which is to say that if I want to compute the value of a field theory on a manifold, what I do is I break it up by taking a Morse function, I break it up into elementary Orders, elementary surgeries. Those elementary surgeries are the kinds of things we've seen here that involve evaluations and co-evaluations. Those are the, um, the expression of the duality data. And saying the object is fully dualizable means I know how to compute them. And so what you need to know is that if you change the Morse function, that this doesn't change. So it's, it's some kind of intractability statement about the surface space of Morse functions that allows you to go through the kind of surface changes of the Morse function and still not change what one computes. So it's a very elaborate and complicated theorem, but it's um, very difficult and very strong consequences, but it says that. So in particular, one immediate thing it says is that if we want to know if field theory is invertible, it suffices to check that alpha of a point is invertible. Because once I have that, then everything is determined by alpha of a point, and if that's invertible, So let me at least state something. So there's a theorem that this is true so far. It says the following. Suppose that an oriented organism is a And so we start with that. And let's assume that f applied to a k-dimensional sphere is invertible for some particular k, which is less than or equal to n over 2. So it's less than or equal to half the dimension. So let me call this one. So if we know that the case here map to something invertible, and I'm at or below the middle dimension, then the whole thing is invertible. So this is a theorem that's stated in terms of a kind of homomorphic image of this algebraic gadget, the Bordism category. But it's really a theorem about the Bordism category. So what it says is, if we take this with all of its algebraic operations, and we invert SK, <coughs> Then, in fact, we've inverted everything. So if we can make sense, as you do in a ring, right? If we have a ring, we can invert an element. And then we can see if we get into a ring. Well, this is like a ring. It has these position laws. <coughs> and if we invert this one element, what it says is everything becomes inverted. So it's just said, to say precisely, in terms of the whole of the dimension. So that's the theorem. So the plan. Tell you a little bit about how this is proved. It's an algebraic proof. And um, then to tell you what that has to do with the first part of the So one construction is to use the cohortism hypothesis. We can find the category C and we find an object that satisfies all the finiteness that is encoded in that word, then that magically, like most functions and so on, constructs a field theory. Physicists would say, well, we should construct a field theory by writing down classically, classical field theory, and then quantizing it. That's hardly the only way that physicists arrive at field theories, but it is one way. 
So we could do that here, at least heuristically, in a situation where the path intervals are all finite sums. So that's where finite groups are nice. So we could build such a field theory out of in any dimension out of a finite group. So for example, we could make a gauge theory where we take um, any manifold X, let's say we assign the fields on X to be the space of G connections. Let's take this to be maps from X to S, where S is a finite set. X is a manifold. Any, any dimension that you want. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is define, oh sorry, what's this? F of X, this quantum invariant, to be, in some sense, the integral over the space of maps. Of something, e to the i, SX i. Okay, well, what's that? That's just a finite sum. The space of maps is just discrete. S is a finite set, X is compact. Okay. So, this is just a finite sum of um, e to the i, SX i. So, we just use a counting version. So, all we have to do is come up with some interesting. Thing to count, and then we'll get such a field theory. So, you know, using topology, we could get something interesting to count, for example. So, if we want a field theory in five dimensions, we can take the class H5 of um, S. Well, that's kind of stupid. Well, you see, we don't get anything interesting if we put in H5. So, let's just say that this S of X, E to the I, What it does on lower dimensional manifolds is it tries to factorize that as you divide the manifold. Well, it's just going to factorize it through trivial things, like lines and curves and whatever. So it, it's, it's a completely silly one. So, but I could make one with some things. And so, what does it do to the same product of vectors? Can you do that in a different way? It just says that if I have a manifold, Then um, I'm essentially counting maps from maps into a finite set. And it says that if I want to count how many maps of the disjoint union there are, I take the count of maps of x1, I take the count of maps of x2, and I multiply them. But it's also supposed to be going down in dimension. Yeah. So if I want to factorize like that, then let's imagine. So what I'm going to do is build, well, I didn't tell you where I want this thing to take values, but you only have integers. So we're going to say that the numbers I get are integers. And then I'm going to get an abelian group, let's say, attached to here. And the abelian group I'm going to pick is just, um, so the abelian group is attached to four manifolds. It's attached to four manifolds. The abelian group is just um, maps from i log of y. For every class of one, what's that? Shouldn't there be an S in there somewhere? A what? Shouldn't S come into that in some way? Well, my S is just zero. <laughs> so. Oh, no, the, the, the S is the finite set. Oh, the S is a finite set. Um, uh, no. Oh. no. No, 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 because to a five manifold, no, to the empty set, I want to attach the integers. So a closed five manifold is going to be an integer which counts this. Oh. And the abelian group attached to the four manifold is going to be this. And so what do I attach to x1? I have to attach an element to this abelian group. And what's the element? Well, given a map, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so right. Uh, I 
is a map from, uh, yeah. so I take, so I take the fields on y, which are these maps to the house, and I take maps from those with these That's the group of the So for every map of the boundary, I can just find a set. What I do is I count how many extensions there are to x1. And that's the problem of the superior group. And then for x2, I did the same thing. So I count, I get an L to the superior group. And now when I glue, well, there has to be a pairing. This is actually a theory of unoriented dimensions. So there's a self pairing of this, which is just, um, if I have a fixed map on the boundary, I have these two. It's like an inner part. I multiply and then I add up the three. So we don't do it in parts of four, I just put it in three. So instead of an abelian group, I'm going to get a, um, I'm going to get, if I look at the category of abelian groups, are there groups of product? Then what I'm going to get is a, well, I'm going to get a forcer over that category, a module. For example, 
know, again, in the kind of invertible things like this, if you take, supposing you take a format, or you take a signature, that's an integer. Now you can say, what if I chop it a longer tree now, or a close tree now, where does the format of the boundary? Then you have a signature for that, and then you can chop that. Well, for signature, there are special things that happen. But if I take, say, spin now, So that locality can be expressed also just staying within the integers. If you have, say, p1 times p2 of the 12 count, or the chop of all the 11 counts, or something like that, you can stay within integers, but we're going to get complicated objects in which to factor them. But they're again local. So expressing something local, you can do it in a classical topology. We have this example, which I think is a nice example to think about. But, um, and so this quantum field theory can be very much the same kind of thing in this world. Much richer where you don't have inverses. But they're complicated because, again, yeah, it's like The signature is not an example of Well, the signature is a little bit special because if you have a format of public boundary, you can make sense of the signature as an object. And is your theorem that some kind of periodicity is written? This invertibility is going yeah. It relates to what I said before. Let me at least make one remark. That if n is equal to 4, then we can take k to be 2, and the theorem will apply. So if we have a four dimensional oriented theory and we know that the two sphere is invertible, then everything is invertible. And so the application is to say that if I take this codomain to be braided tensor categories, and if I know that a modular tensor category, this is the part we're still but if we know that a modular tensor category satisfies all the finiteness to allow this statement, to allow us to build a field theory whose value on a point is the modular tensor category, then we can calculate what's attached to the two sphere. And what we would calculate is exactly the thing I wrote down, the set of objects x for which for all y in the brain of y composed of y ten, comma x composed of the of x, comma y is the identity. Get exactly that category attached to the two sphere. And a modular tensor category is the assumption that that's equal to the trivial category of x, which is inverted. So the non degeneracy of a modular tensor category is exactly that hypothesis in that case. So that shows you that the um, field theory, the four dimensional field theory you get, is an invertible field theory. And then the idea is to go on from there and look at tensor category is a module under itself, and that builds a three-dimensional theory which has values in this four-dimensional theory, much the same way at the beginning of the lecture we thought about uh, chiral rational conformal field theory is taking values in a three-dimensional topological field. So there it was two and three, the bottom one is conformal, the top one is topological. Here we get something where both are topological, but the top one, the three-dimensional one is topological, and the four-dimensional one in which it takes values is actually invertible. So that's what's called an anomalous field theory. That's the concept of an anomalous field theory. And, um, and then there's this little story about recovering from that unusual uh, field theory, three dimensional field theory you construct from a modular tensor category on the one, two, and three dimensional ones. So this is a way of extending it to down to a fully extended field theory, fitting into this important hypothesis. Um, but it's not an ordinary field theory. It's a slight twist in which it's anomalous. So I should say that Andre, together with Chris Douglas and uh, Dr. Bartles, are working in a different approach where they don't take get an anomalous field theory, but rather they get an ordinary field theory using all X ordered spaces. But their theory is about not about oriented. When we want to relate ours to theirs, we also have to do a frame manifest to get rid of that twist problem, this anomaly.
So I think when I've heard you talk about this before, I, I remember this being stated as, as uh, for k equals n over 2 rather than less than or equal to. Am I, am I just confused about that, or did, did you um, change how you say this? Oh, okay. But, um, but, well, just imagine the extreme case when k is 0. Yeah. Well, when k is 0, if I know that the 0 sphere is invertible, then I'm really dumb because I have the plus point and the minus point. And I want to say that these are inverse. Yeah. And I want to, so I need a map from 1, a nice morphism from 1 to the tensor product, which is. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. the tensor product is the disjoint union. The 1 is the empty map. That's my okay. morphism. But um, right. so if I know that S naught is invertible, then I know this is a nice morphism. Uh -huh. okay. So it's harder to go down. I see. Okay. So there's the, the proof goes by first you can go up. You can work your way up from K to the top and prove all the spheres are invertible. Yeah. That's easy. But now you have to work your way down. And you need to be a little bit below or at the middle dimension. It's easier somehow to do so. And it's certainly false if you don't. For example, people who know three dimensional turn assignments theory will know that's attached to a um, two sphere, and it's usually a lock. 